stand up here week in and week out, standing here alone on this platform. Week after week, people gather to hear what I have to say. Day after day, they expect me to solve their problems. I'm on call night and day. Constantly, my phone rings in the middle of the night. I can never go out in public without people scrutinizing or watching my every move. I, can, um, make, I can't even make a decision without a bunch of folks second-guessing me and second-guessing my opinions. I've sacrificed my family for this job, and still people say that I never do enough. There are those in this place that actually want to get rid of me. Well, I've had enough. I finally got to the place where I'm not going to take it anymore. And I hate to spoil your Easter celebration, especially those of you who are visiting this morning, but this is just as a good time as any to tell you that I'm through with the politics around here. I'm through with the fighting. I'm through with all of the nonsense. And I've decided this morning that I'm going to wash my hands off the whole thing. And I'm going to move on. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. And by the way, lest you think that this is your pastor speaking, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Pilot, Pontius Pilot. I hail from the hill countries, a small village of Vicente in the hill countries of central Italy. I can trace my tribe, my roots, all the way to the ancient tribe of Ponti, a direct descendant of its founder, Pontius. He was the javelin thrower, the one that made our village famous. We were already civilized wine connoisseurs when Rome was a dirt poor village and her illiterates were digging in the mud for, uh, for mud snails on the banks of the Tiberus. But now, Rome is the capital of the world. All the roads in the country and the world lead back to Rome, and I'm the good old boy from Vicente. Worse than that, I was a horse rider in the Roman caste system, a middle-class bureaucrat. For years, I played all of the political games that I needed to play to climb the ladder. I was moving up and up, and along the way, I had to kiss up to a lot of people, a lot of politicians. And all the while, I was never getting anywhere in life. And then I finally got a break. They asked me to be a governor. Well, not exactly, because a governor has a nice role, but they sent me to a place that no one wanted to go. They sent me to the backwaters of Jerusalem, of Judea, where there were a bunch of messianic fanatics and religious bigots and wild-eyed terrorists that were living there. For years, Judea was the, the graveyard of Roman people that wanted to become governors and rulers, but they could never control the peace there, and that's where their political careers ended. They could never satisfy religious bigots or quell revolutionary riots. But I was going to go to do what no one else has ever done. I was going to go keep law and order in the land. I was going to make sure that I was going to succeed, even if it meant that I had to crucify every Jew that tried to stand against me. I remember the day that the emperor handed me the commission. Tiberius Caesar Augustus had a Jewish fixation. He wanted this land to prosper. He was committed to seeing good things come out of Judea. He told me that if I would succeed, it would be my ticket to a full governorship, possibly even back in Italy, back where I was from. And then he gave me the most coveted title of all that you could have as a Roman person. He called me a friend of Caesar. My success was set if only I could keep the peace in the land. Listen, I can tell you it wasn't easy at all. Every day it seemed like there were messiahs popping up that were trying to stir up trouble in the land. Just a few days ago, I had to take down a, a fanatic and his henchmen, and now they were set to be crucified. And maybe you can understand the pressure that I was at that Passover morning 
See, I know that history has branded me a coward who sentenced Jesus to death, but for political expediency and then completely washed my hand of the whole affair. 2,000 years have come and gone, but you still see me as like a one-dimensional cartoon, cardboard villain. That's what you see me as. Your 20th century English writer, Noel Coward, wrote of me that said, Pilate washed his hands and stained his soul. He is the patron soul for all those who say, peace for anything, anything for peace and quiet, even at the cost of my own soul. Your books, your movies, your plays, still convict me in your court of public opinion. In their song, Sympathy of the Devil, the Rolling Stones wrote, Pilate washed his hands and sealed his fate. Arthur Miller's famous play, The Crucible, says that I'm an archetype of all cowards who wash their hands of the responsibility. Even your comic books, Marvel Comics' next wave lists me as an archvillain alongside a monster, a bloodthirsty pirate, a sky rat, and a midget Hitler. In their song, Pilot, rock band Pearl Jam portrays me as a wishy-washy loser. So you can despise me if you want, but when you hear my side of the story, when you hear my account of that day, you just might see that you and I, we have a lot in common. Like me, you know what it means to be pulled by conflicting emotions and divided loyalties. Like me, you too have been in places where you've got to make a hard decision, a decision that someone was going to be upset with. See, but the greatest decision that you will ever make is the one that I try to avoid. And it's the question that's even being asked this morning. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? See, Jerusalem was a volcano already ready to explode when they dragged me out of my bed that morning. Two million Jews have gathered from all over the world to celebrate Passover. Messianic fever was at a, messianic passion was at a fever pitch. I said earlier, but a few days ago, my troops had to crawl down an uprising. The leader, a terrorist and a murderer by the name of Barabbas, alongside of with two of his henchmen, were actually set to be crucified this day. The people were in an uproar because my soldiers had killed several Jewish pilgrims along the way in the rebellion. And standing before me this morning was a lynch mob, orchestrated, believe it or not, by the religious leaders of the day. They looked like sharks circling for the kill, but I could hear the hiss of the snake Crucify him. Crucify him. And then I saw the man that they wanted to lynch. A rabbi from the hills of Galilee. I knew who he was. My spies had already told me about him. His name was Yeshua ben Joseph, or Jesus but he insisted that he was the Christ, the anointed one, or the Messiah. As far as I was concerned, he was a nobody. Come on. I've got guys who are trying to create riots and havoc, and then there's this guy who's going around teaching, blessed are the peacemakers. What do I have to worry about him for? His teaching says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall be comforted. He's the last person I have to worry. Surely Rome had nothing to worry about someone who promoted meekness. But the crowd, they wanted blood. See, we Romans had a saying, the voice of the people is the voice of God. But I wonder if your British philosopher Edmund Burke said it better when he said, the voice of the people is the voice of the devil. See, even as they demanded the crucifixion of this Galilean, I felt like I was being crucified myself, suspended between Jesus on one side and the lynch mob on the other side, hanging on the nails of my own moral dilemma. See, as a man of the law, I knew that Jesus was innocent. There was nothing wrong with him, but as a governor, my future was twisting in the hands 
of political opinion. See, I, know, I now know that I was standing at the crossroads of my own eternal destiny. It was either Christ or the crowd. It was my conscience or my political career. One of your Gospels, the Gospel of John, Matthew, says it this way. It, hears, it, it shares my cry when it says, What shall I do? What shall I do with this man Jesus who is called the Christ? See, this morning Jesus is standing before you just like he stood before me some 2,000 years ago. You too have to answer the same question. What will I do with Jesus? See, this question never goes away. You can try to ignore it. You can try to avoid it. But sooner or later, it always comes back to you. I tried my best to avoid this man named Jesus. In fact, I tried five different ways to avoid this man named Jesus. And maybe this morning you are playing the same game that I played. The first ploy that I tried to do was I asked him, who can really know the truth? That's recorded in your Gospels, the 18th chapter of the book of John. I had Jesus brought to the judgment seat and I asked him, are you really a king? And Jesus said, you are right in saying that I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came to the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is on the side of truth will listen to me. Can you imagine my shock as I am looking at this man in chains, and I am the one on the throne, and he says he is the king. He makes the most preposterous claim that he is the only true king and the only source of all truth. And then he had the audacity to tell me that if I was on the side of truth, that I would believe him. I was flabbergasted. And so I responded back to Jesus and I said, what is truth? Between us, that was a cynical question. I wasn't asking him for an answer. I was an educated person. I studied under the finest philosophers of my day. I was schooled in the ancient religions of Rome. I was taught by amazing men who knew so much. I knew all of the Romans' gods and their rituals. But see, by like most educated Romans, I had rejected the gods as old-fashioned. See, we had a word for those who believed in gods. We call them paganists, from which you get your English word pagans, which means hillbillies or country folk. See, the Rome that I knew was a smorgasbord of religious fads. You could pick and choose whatever floated your boat that morning. Pubilus, a historian, wrote that our citizens change religions as often as they change their clothes. And when I asked Jesus what is truth, I was basically telling him that no one has a corner on truth. No one can say this is exact truth. And maybe you're here and you feel the exact same way. I relate to your pop star Madonna um, when she said to a reporter, I'm still a little Roman Catholic girl immersed in the Jewish Kabbalah filled with the spirit of Buddha and a smor smorgasbord of whatever else gets me through the night. If I was sitting there in front of Madonna, I probably would have said, you go, girl. I know what you're talking about. See, but I discovered that Jesus will not allow us to see him as just another prophet. He will not share equal billing with Muhammad or Buddha or any other religious founder or a New Age guru he alone says that he is God and he is the only way to heaven. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis says that the claims of Jesus are so audacious that either he is a liar or a lunatic or he has to be telling the truth. There are no other options. See, I asked 
Jesus that day, what is truth? And I didn't even realize that truth was standing in front of me. And Jesus wouldn't let me play that game of what is truth, and neither can you. I learned the hard way that we all have to make a choice. And I tried to wiggle off the hook again. So I thought I could try another scheme or another way to get out of this. And so I thought I could pass Jesus off and let someone else make the choice for me. And you can read about that in the 23rd chapter of Luke when you read what I did next. The religious leaders were standing in front of me and they were chanting, he stirs up the people all over Judea. He began over in Galilee and has come all the way here with his teachings. And this, when I heard that, it felt like this was my way out. He's a Galilean. That means he's not under my jurisdiction. That he's actually under the jurisdiction of Herod. I figured maybe I could pass the buck. If Herod decides to let him go, I would let him go. If Herod decides to crucify him, then I would go along with it. But let Herod take the blame for what happens to Jesus. And maybe you play the same game with Jesus. Whatever the culture says is morally and politically correct, you do that too. Whatever your professors at college think, you think that too. Whatever your friends at school believe, you believe that too. You watch what the crowd does and you do the exact same thing. Your parents might be Christians, so you just happen to be Christians as well. Whatever your wife thinks about religion, you go along with. Whatever your pastor happens to say is true, you assume is true. When you do that, you're playing my game. See, but my game backfired on me. Herod asked Jesus to do some miracles for him. And when the Galilean rabbi refused to do magic tricks for the amusement of that tyrant, Herod got bored with him and sent him back to me. Jesus never goes away. He will always confront you. See, I can tell you that no one else can make the crucial decisions of life for you. I had to breed for myself. No one else could do that for me. One day I have to die. No one else can do that for me. One day I will have to stand before God alone. No one else can take my place. No one else can give an account of my life before the judgment seat of God. Not Herod, not my parents, not my wife, not my children, not my friends, not the opinion makers of cultural elite. See, I had to answer the question, what will I do with Jesus? And so do you, my friends. You have to answer that question. Trying to pass Jesus off didn't work, and so I thought, hey, let me try another scheme. Maybe there's another way I can get out of this, and I thought I would offer a substitute for Jesus. And you can read about that in the 27th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. I remember, see, I had instituted a, instituted a custom to try to gain favor with the Jewish people, I would let them choose one of their prisoners to release on their Passover. I was trying to get their approval so I can continue to climb the ladder and get more and more positions. I remembered in prison was a man by the name of Barabbas. So I asked the crowd that was growing more unmanageable by the minute, who do you want me to release to you? I've got Jesus here who's just a teacher, has never heard a heard of anyone. And then I've got Barabbas who's murdered your own people. Who do you want me to release to you? See, the last person I wanted to release, and I thought the people would want to release, was Barabbas. He was the most infamous terrorist of the day, much like your Boko Haram or ISIS or Osama bin Laden. I was positive that there was no one in the crowd that I would want Barabbas released. See, if only I had known now what I know, if only I had known then what I know now, I would have understood that people will give their allegiance to the most grotesque things of this world rather than bow their knee to the creator of the universe. See, I have come back to warn you not to play my game. The world will offer a buffet of substitutes for Jesus they all lead to emptiness. 
400 years after I died, St. Augustine wrote in his book, Confessions, that God has made us for himself, and we will be restless until we find our rest in him. Only Jesus can give you rest for your weary souls. But the re people rejected him as a substitute. Who or what is your substitute today? Who do you think will satisfy your life the way that Jesus would satisfy your life? Is it your family? Is it money or possessions? Or is it your reputation? Or is it career? Listen, it didn't work for me. And it will not for you. Barabbas was set free. And I only had two plays left up my sleeve. Only two more ways to try to get out of this. And so I thought I would try to play both sides of the fence. See, I still had a politician's favorite ace up my sleeve. If you know any politicians, and it probably hasn't changed since I left, the one thing that politicians do best is that we compromise. We lie really good, but we also compromise really well. Your Gospel of John it tells you what happened next, and it says that I took Jesus and I had my soldiers flog him. See, when it came to bloodshed, I was not a squeamish man. The Jewish historians wrote of me that I was a ruthless man given to gross brutality. But even I found it hard to watch someone getting flogged. The victim is stretched out across a rock. The strongest soldiers in my army would yield whips, whips made of leather and embedded with rocks and glass and, ja and ja jaded pieces of metal, and they would beat the miserable man. He is ripped to shreds with and you see raw, bloody meat on him. No part of his body goes unscathed while he is brought to the very edge of death but does not die. Afterwards, my soldiers mocked this Jesus. They spit on him. In fact, they took some thorns and made a crown and they placed it on his head six feet, six inches long and they beat it into his skull. They slapped his face until it was bruised and swollen. Your prophet Isaiah says that uh, prophesied so well that he was disfigured so well, so much that no one could bear to look at him. Listen, do you think I did that out of cruelty? Do you think that I did that because I wanted to hurt Jesus? See, I didn't want to hurt him. I did it to save his life. I had this grotesque figure paraded before me like a bloody scarecrow before the lynch mob. You can read what I told them, what I said to them in John 19. I said, behold the man. This is what I was trying to say. I was trying to tell them, take a good look at him. You thought that he was a threat to you guys? You thought that he was going to create a riot? Look at him. He's beaten. He's bloody. He's not going to do anything. Just let him go. Release him. I knew that I couldn't crucify Jesus. My conscience couldn't stand such a travesty of justice. But on the other hand, I couldn't offend this crowd that was standing before me. That might damage my career. So I mutilated Jesus as kind of a halfway measure. But the crowd was not satisfied with my compromise. In fact, they just started shouting louder, crucify him, crucify him. Listen, the crowd never accepts a compromise. Not then. Not 2,000 years later. And then I looked into the eyes of Jesus and I realized that Jesus doesn't accept compromise either. Crown me or crucify me. But you can never compromise me. Either I am Lord of all or not Lord at all. See, I tried to stall for time. I racked my brain for a way out. My wife sends me a message through my soldiers warning me of nightmares that she was having about Jesus that tormented her, and she begged me not to crucify him, but to let him go. But then on the other side, I could hear the leaders of the mob yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. If you let him go, that you are, then you are not a friend of Caesar. Friend of Caesar. That was my coveted title. 
That was my ticket to a future promotion. I couldn't let that go. So I pulled what was left out of my bag. And I tried to wash my hands of the whole thing. This was the last ploy of every cornered politician. I tried to blame someone else and duck out of town. See, I took a bowl of water and I began to wash my hands of the dirty mess. I cried out to the mob. I said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. I want nothing to do with this. See, I tried to get Herod to make a decision for me, but he refused. And now I tried to let the crowd do it for me. And he took my breath away when they responded, let his blood be on us and our children. In that moment, out of hatred for this man, Jesus, they were willing to curse themselves and their children for generations to come. But at least they took responsibility for their action. But the truth is, I was a responsible one. I signed the death warrant. My soldiers nailed him to the cross. All the water in the world couldn't wash away the blood of Jesus. But at least I thought I was rid of him. I thought I would never see his face again. After he was dragged away, I calmed my nerves down with a goblet of wine. I, I tried to soothe my conscience with the thought that these bloody religious leaders had made the decision, not me. Later, my soldiers sent me a message. They said, the rabbi is dead. They said the guard is posted at his tomb, and Jerusalem went to bed at peace that night. I breathed a sigh of relief. I had dodged a bullet. I had kept the peace. My future was still looking promising. But then all of a sudden, on a Sunday morning, just three days later, I heard the news that shook my soul. The tomb was empty. His disciples were walking around spreading the news that they had seen the risen Jesus. He just wouldn't go away. See, pretend the truth cannot be known, and he will stand before you with evidence that he is the truth. Send him away to someone else, and he will be back. Exchange him for Barabbas, but that won't satisfy anyone. Try compromise, flog him, but let him live, but no one will buy it. Wash your hands of the whole thing. Crucify him so that he is dead to you. But the resurrected Jesus will come back with the same question that he asked me 2,000 years ago. And he's asking you today, what are you going to do with me? What are you going to do with me? My attempt to pacify the crowd failed. Shortly after the Galileans' crucifixion, there was another uprising that got out of hand in, in the area. I was sent back to Rome in disgrace. And they stripped me of the title that I had tried so hard to keep, the friend of Caesar. The emperor sent me into exile. My wife never forgave me for crucifying Jesus in fact, she blamed me for all that because I crucified Jesus, all of these curses fell on my family. Your early church fathers wrote about my descent into madness. See, I couldn't shake the image of Jesus at all. At night, your Jesus inhabited my nightmares. He never goes away. One day I descended, I ascended into a mountain with a bottle in hand, and I became a public drunk. And that night I climbed to the top of the high cliffs above a Swiss lake near the modern-day Lausanne. The locals there still call that mountain Mount Pilatus. And there I jumped to my death in the lake below. And as I descended into the darkness of the frigid, cold waters, I thought to myself, I am finally free of Jesus. I'm finally free of him. 
see, but the reality was as the waters began to fill my lungs and darkness was pitching in, all of a sudden I began to see a light, a tunnel of light. I was being pulled from death toward the afterlife. And again, I see the rabbi from Galilee standing before me. This time, he is not someone that's chained and beaten. This time, I'm not sitting on the throne. This time, he is seated on the throne in all majesty and glory. The tables have been turned. I, who was the judge, now stands accused. And the accused now stands before me as the judge. See, later they found my bloated and bruised body. They say that I looked strangely like what Jesus must have looked like right after he was flogged. This morning I've come back through the corridors of history to warn you. You have to make a choice with Jesus. What will you do with Jesus today? See, because of Easter, what you are celebrating this morning, Jesus never goes away. He is the risen King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the question that was confronted with me is the question that you are confronted with today. What will you do with Jesus? See, when I was confronted with that, Jesus was standing before me as a prisoner, but as a prisoner, but now he is standing before us as the resurrected Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Will you receive him as your Savior? Will you bow your knee to him as your Lord? Will you acknowledge that he is the king? So you have to act on that ultimate and inescapable question of life. What will you do with Jesus?